I'm really not comfortable with this. <laughs> I will just speak loudly. Uh, so our next class is designing your network systems. We're going to pick up with a couple of things at the end of David's presentation, uh, and then we will jump right into all of that. Uh, two new people joining us now. Uh, first is Tracy Fitch, uh, who is hiding. hiding. <laughs> Tracy is one of our networking ninjas. Uh, he's an advanced project specialist, so he's. Who's, he's who we send out when things really go wrong, uh, who I call for help. Uh, another person I call for help all the time is Tom. Uh, Tom McGuire is a field service engineer out of our London office. He has the shortest commute. I'll come up with a better joke tomorrow. No, no, technically I do, because I'm in the hotel next door. <laughs> 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 all right, so uh, that's all yours, guys. OK. So. Uh, we are going to pick up with a, a little bit about IP address allocation because it was alluded to at the end of the last class. So uh, we want to make sure that we actually, I don't know, answer questions. Call me crazy. Um, Spacebar, yeah, it works. Okay. Uh, there are different methods for allocating IP addresses, and this is kind of history moving forward to today is what we have. So there's static IP addressing, boot P, DHCP, and then link local. And we're just going to run through them kind of quickly. Static IP addressing is how we started. That means every device gets an IP address. Somehow you go to the device and configure it. What does that mean? It may mean dip switches. It may mean that it actually has a keypad and you can type something in. It meant many different things for different products. In the case of uh, some manufacturers of lighting products for a while, it meant it shipped with an IP address, and I hope you like that one. Um, <laughs> all of those were options that were used. Uh, from there, though, in our world, we moved into something called boot P. Uh, boot P is something that in the computing world was designed for dumb terminals that were coming online. The premise was, I don't necessarily have an interface that I can go to on every product to set everything up. But as the guy who is configuring the whole system, I want to have control over the IP addresses that are assigned. So what, the way that works is a device boots up and it says, hey, here's me. At this point, it doesn't have an IP address, so it just has that MAC address we were talking about. This is me and my MAC address. Uh, can I have an IP address, please? <laughs> and there's a server on the network, and that server looks at a list and says, OK, your dot three dot twelve dot, you know, whatever, and passes that on. And the device then takes that information and boots up. It may or may not store that permanently, or it may expect that to be there, that server to be online every time when it boots up. Those of you who had Net2 products, this is probably what you remember. It had an IP address, and you have to go back and reset the thing if you want to change it. Uh, well, that wasn't the only way to set it, but it was the easiest way. Um, from there, the IT world moved forward. Primarily, this happened because of colleges, because that's where the internet was really big first. They realized that they have a pool of IP addresses they were allocated. These are the numbers you can have. And then they had a pool of possible devices that would be on the network as students started bringing computers to campus and these types of things. These two numbers did not match. <laughs> the number of possible devices far exceeded the number of IP addresses they had available. But they didn't have all of those things online at the same time, so they needed to find another way forward. And that's where DHCP came from, Dynamic Host Configuration Protocol. It works similar to boot P in that you boot up and you say, hey, this is my MAC address. Can I get an IP address, please? The difference is that when the server gives back an IP address, it also gives a lease time. You have this IP address for this long. At the end of that time, you have to ask again. Um, <laughs> in practice, it actually asks earlier than that. It starts with, you know, if the, if the lease was 24 hours, then at 12 hours, your computer's going to ask again. And then it gets 24 hours from there, and that continues. Is that a question? Yeah. So 
if you find that your device isn't working and you're given the option to renew your lease, mm -hmm. it's basically saying, okay, I think my lease has expired, so I just hit renew lease and it'll start it all over again? Uh, it depends on what the, the host operating system is, what it's going to prompt that message, but what renew, renew lease means is it is going to make the quest, the request. Mm -hmm. uh, it may be that it actually thinks that it's as a duplicate. Mm -hmm. There's somebody else who has that one as well these kinds of things. Part of the goal of DHCP, and this is the reason we've moved to it for mobile devices in lighting networks, is to avoid that accidental duplicate. Anybody who has a Net2 system, if you have more than one, <laughs> at some point you have probably, when something was broken or something got bigger really quickly, you have run to the other venue and you have grabbed your Net2 node and you have brought it across the street or the alley or whatever that that uh, path is to the other theater and you have plugged it in and you have been absolutely unable to reconfigure it or do anything with it. I don't know, maybe it was just me and everyone I ever talked to when I was in phone support, but I, I felt like it happened. <laughs> um, <laughs> what that meant is the IP address that was given to that node over here is already in use over here. You brought it to another network and it can't have that IP. DHCP cures that because when the device boots up, it makes the request again. Hey, is this me? Uh, now, op devices do have an option to store that lease information and bring it back uh, if they want to on boot, but they still have to make the request and potentially be told, no, you can't have that. Um, so this is basically the process, which means you ask, you get something, you keep it until your lease expires, then you give it up. Um, some possible DHCP servers on an ETC network, uh, EOS or, while this slide needs to be updated, Cobalt Family Console, uh, <laughs> a Net3 conductor, a computer with our gateway configuration editor. Noel, don't, I mean, Lowell, don't hit me for that still being on the slide. It's not my slide. Um, <laughs> Also, third-party DHCP servers. One of the things that's happened is, uh, even when we were doing BootP, we were doing our own slight modification of how the world did it. What's happened as we've moved forward is we've realized every time that we do something slightly different from the rest of the world, it just makes everyone's life harder later, <laughs> right? <laughs> so when we make a DHCP request, we make it exactly the same way your laptop does, exactly the same way something else does. It's possible for your DHCP server on your network to not be an ETC product at all. Um, you could have a third-party device, like a, oh, a common one might be a, a consumer internet router or something like that. You could have something that your IT department decided would run all of the IP addresses on the network, and boy, I sure hope you like it. You could have any of those. <laughs> It'll all still work. Um, the next step after that is something called link local. Link local is uh, a great idea. It has some practical uh, uh, challenges to deal with. It's great in concept if you are starting from a network where there is nothing online. Part of the challenge of DHCP, right? We said you have to have the server there to answer that question. Okay. So what do you do if you're trying to come online and there is no server? That's what link local is. Link local says, I make a DHCP request, nobody answers me. Okay, well, I can either just stay offline, that's one option, or if link local is an option, what happens is I make up an IP address. I invent my own. Then I verify that nobody else is using it. As long as nobody else is using it, I take that and I run with it. That's my IP address. And now when any other device comes online, it's gonna follow that same process, which means it's not going to pick the same one as me, because if it does, I'm going to say, no, you can't have that, and it's going to try again. Hmm. Link local devices, you may have seen this if you have Net3 gateways in your system. At some point, you've booted one up, and it says its IP address, after a long pause, is 169.254.something. That range, 169.254.anything, is a link local IP address. Those devices can all talk to each other, but remember that conversation about the gateway setting? They don't have a gateway. Because where's it gonna get one? How's it gonna know what to use, right? So it doesn't know. 
It can talk to devices within its subnet. It can't talk to anything outside its subnet. That's why when you have your gateway and it booted up and it says it's in 169.254. something and you try and use our configuration software to talk to it on your laptop that's set up as 10.101. something, you can kind of see it, but you can't really do anything with it. Turn on a DHCP server, then it'll actually be able to get an IP address and go. So does it keep trying even though it's allocated itself one? So that when that server comes on, it will add it up automatic? Or do you have to kind of reboot it or something? Uh, the question is, do they keep trying or not? Do they, do they keep asking? And the answer is, it depends on the device. Um, in general, with most of our devices, they will make a second or a third request during at some interval. That interval tends to get longer the longer the device is online, and it's probably long enough that you'll be happier if you just go reboot it. Um, in theory, it should straighten itself out eventually, but eventually is usually long after you're really frustrated. <laughs> um, so. Sorry, so pulling the research to just assign a static IP, and, you know, if you're having problems with that device, and it's not okay, it's not connecting to the SPCP server, would it be easier to just assign a static IP? Uh, the question is, would it be easier to assign a static IP? And the answer is it depends on the device and what it's for. Uh, like Lowell mentioned in the last class, our, our thinking varies depending on the device. If it's something that's bolted to the wall and going to stay there forever, absolutely, assign it a static IP. Uh, if it's something that's portable, like a gateway that you may move from venue to venue, from network to network, that's when DHCP is your friend. Or if you have a laptop that you move from venue to venue to venue, uh, then that's when DHCP can be your friend. Uh, because if there's a DHCP server on each of those networks, you will get an IP address that will work on that network in each venue. Does that answer your question? Yeah, sort of. It's, 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 if the device is having problems, it's struggling to, to go get a, a, a dynamic IP. Okay. Uh, Okay, so the other part of the question then is if the device is just having issues for some reason, depends on the device. I can tell you that we have some uh, features in concert that I'm sure you will see later <laughs> that will help you assign a static IP to a device if you don't have a DHCP server anywhere in order to get it online. Um, in terms of DHCP servers uh, living somewhere on the network uh, and third party, even, mm -hmm. does ETC have a preferred Attack, you know, as far as an RPU that lives in Iraq and that's always on, so you're always able to receive the DHCP, or do you have a third party switch that you have great success with in the past that you would recommend, or how, oh. how do you guys ideally want, and then what do you see out in the field as far as installations? Okay, and the question is what's basically what's our preferred system and what are we actually encountering as far as a DHCP server? Uh, there's really two answers to that question one of which will be a nice prelude to later in the day. Um, so the first answer to that question is in a small console-centric system, you've got an RPU and a desk or something like that. Every one of these consoles that are on that other list that you're not looking at right now, um, the, the Cobalt family consoles, the EOS family consoles, have the capability to be a DHCP server. Typically, in that kind of environment, if there is an RPU that lives in Iraq that stays on, that would be our suggestion. Make that one your DHCP server. Um, <clears throat> on a larger system, a larger architectural system, or something of that nature, we have a product called Net3 Conductor, TM. Or is it TM, SM? I don't know. Some kind of marker thing uh, <laughs> uh, that can do that job for you. It's also the, a good solution for venues that actually power down all of that gear every night. Is it its own rack mount? It is, in fact, a rack mount unit that you will, you will see later. OK. Other questions? Then we're on to what's happening on the wire and Mr. McGuire. Who was totally Thank hiding you. on I the was far hiding, side? Yes, uh, yeah. <laughs> cool. Um, uh, so we're just going to talk about um, what data we're transferring, or what types of data we're transferring on the wire. We, we're not talking about protocols here. It's just how they they transfer that information. Uh, and there are three. Uh, we've got broadcast, unicast, and multicast. Uh, and these, uh, the different ways of sending this will depend on how much load you're putting on your system or your devices. So broadcast is sending all of your information to every device on the network. Okay? Uh, and it's great, 
probably works first time because you just send it and plug in, away you go. Uh, unicast is you're talking to a specific device. So I'm transmitting to one device and then I'm transmitting to a next, the next device and then the next device and the next device. And at that point you're now trying to talk to multiple devices in order and when you're say sending something like DMX you're transmitted to all of them and then you start again and you're constantly transmitting that information. Multicast is the information is sent to a group of nodes. Um, it's just took it, I'll come on to it when we get to the diagram. So broadcast goes out uh, and hits every node on the system. Okay. Unicast, so we're going from the TI to the Net3 gateway, straight connection. Doesn't talk to anybody else, nobody else sees that information. Multicast is the TI sending to a multicast channel and then other devices that want to listen to that multicast information will go and look at that multicast channel. So only the devices that want to know about that information find out about it and the TI only has to send it to one place. Okay. So more data going backwards and forwards, Ooh, gone too far. So console multicast there is the green arrows, your paradigm and your SACN they're all transmitting to different multicast channels and they're all listening to the right ones they need to listen to. Okay. So it's a much more efficient way of transmitting data backwards and forwards because you only listen to the bits you need and the transmitter only has to send to one place. Yep. Are, are multicast packets still sent to a specific IP address to see other one has in or is it sent out? Yeah, so the question was, uh, are multicast packets sent to a specific IP address? They are and then every device will look to that IP address. So SACN universes have an IP address for each universe, and it will go to look for that right one. I can't remember the numbers. Tracy, do you know them off the top? Uh, it's 239.255, and then you break up the universe number into two octets. <laughs> yep. well, why the distinction? What are the benefit to a multicast system versus broad if, if everything is getting everything? So the question is, what's the benefit of multicast over broadcast? The, the main benefit is that um, only the devices that want that multicast information will get it. Mm -hmm. And you're not slowing down other pieces of equipment that are having to filter through all this broadcast mm -hmm. traffic mm -hmm. to find the bit of information right. they want. So the, the shortcut definition of that is the node at the end of the line can have a smaller processor if it's on a system with multicast data than if it's on a system with broadcast data. Because it doesn't have to deal with all the other data it doesn't care about. And you've got the reverse of that when it comes to unicast the transmitter is not having to try and talk to and all the devices. Are on the free products innately all of these, or how does, it, how does it work? Depends on the bit that you're dealing with. <laughs> SACN is multicast, yes. and there's various other things that is all uh, probably unicast. Yeah. I, think, I don't think we do broadcast. Uh, we don't have much that's broadcast except native TCP IP <laughs> protocols. Any other questions? I'm going to hand back over to Tracy for ah, okay. wireless. So uh, one question that typically comes up once the term router gets mentioned especially is wireless communication. Um, and uh, I'm going to skip through one slide here because it's not my presentation. Uh, two slides, okay, fine. Uh, <laughs> wireless communication, how do I deal with a router in my system? How do I deal with the fact, typically the first part is, right, how do I get my IRFR to talk to my console? That's really the question. We could, if we eliminate a lot of other words in there, right? Um, and the answer is, you're going to put some kind of a wireless access device in. There are devices called wireless access points, and there are devices called wireless routers. A wireless access point is really essentially just a translator between wireless and wired Ethernet communication. Um, so they're simple, they're easy. You plug it on to the network and then any device that connects to that wireless access point is immediately transmitting data through that wireless access point to the rest of the system. They're much simpler to work with. Uh, they are available in various levels up to a high-end enterprise grade system that can be managed rather than going and configuring one or another. You configure 128 of them in one interface 
and say they're going to work together and do this. This is what uh, campus IT departments, corporate IT departments and such deploy to do these types of things. The hard part about wireless access points is you're not going to find one on the shelf at Best Buy. You're going to find a wireless router on the shelf at Best Buy because that's the thing that everybody wants to take home and plug into their one connection that they're getting from Comcast and turn it into a bunch of connections to talk to everything without telling Comcast they're doing that, right? <laughs> Actually, I guess they've mostly gotten rid of the extra fee for extra devices that used to exist. Wireless routers have the potential to be more problematic for us. They also have the potential to be helpful to us. It depends on how we hook it up. Okay. Because it's a router, it's smarter. It has more things it does. It has more things it can do. Sometimes it tries to outsmart us. That's when it turns into a challenge for us. So here is my incredibly accurate rendering of the connections on a wireless router. Okay. <laughs> they all look exactly like this with this color code, right? That's what everybody's seeing, I'm sure. Okay. Uh, there are two types of physical ports on most wireless routers. There's a WAN port, it may be labeled WAN, it may be labeled internet, it may be labeled modem. My personal favorite is the little like globe uh, icon, whatever it is. It's the thing that goes to the world. Right? And then there are LAN ports. LAN ports is the local area network. The stuff that in your house would be all the things that you're connecting together. Right. The two types of ports are not interchangeable. Most of the time when people have issues, it's because they're taking configuration guidance that's being offered from someone suggesting plugging in your principal network to one way or the other and applying it to the reverse. Okay. Um, I have my preferred way to hook up a, an IRFR wireless router. And it has to do with how these things come out of the box. When you take them out of the box, typically, a, a router has built into it really three interfaces. Remember we said a, a, a router has at least two? A wireless router has typically at least three. Okay. Uh, it has a WAN interface. That's the thing that's designed to go to the outside world. When it boots up, it's typically configured so that on that interface, it is a DHCP client. It says, hey, I need an IP address and your home uh, internet device says, here's an IP, go for it. On the other two interfaces, it's a DHCP server. So it passes out IP addresses. Uh, that's incredibly useful to us, as long as we remember that it's there. Right? Now, there are options to change all of these things. You can usually go in and configure your router, you can turn off the DHCP server, you can set a, a hundred different things. The thing is, especially in our phone support department, we don't know every router out there. We have no idea where that menu setting is in what router. We have a benefit, though, in that if we assume this is the default, which it usually is, um, we know how it works. We also know that it has built in essentially a firewall that is there to help you and protect your home from the dangers of the internet. I feel like I should like do that in a really deep voice, but you know what I mean. Okay. Well, that firewall can also help us. The tiny uh, consumer grade radio that's in your average wireless router is not going to stand up to all of the traffic that we send across a lighting network. Okay. Now, if you are on a network with switches that are actually working with multicast and able to, to filter things down, that's great. Uh, if you're on that type of a network, you also may have a proper managed wireless access point deployment. If you're on the router that you picked up at Best Buy, you may also be plugging into the switch you picked up at Best Buy. Uh, and it's not really going to filter that multicast traffic. It's still going to kind of pass it on everywhere. Okay. We need to stop some of that traffic from going onto the, into the IR. I mean, not the IR, the, the RF. We don't want your phone to try and receive 63,999 streaming ACN universes. <laughs> well, I mean, maybe you do, but uh, I can tell you that that little, that little router is going to do the thing that they all do every you know, three days anyway, which is get really hot, overheat, freeze, and you're going to have to reboot it. Okay. 
Instead, we can block most of that communication, but still allow the kind of communication that we need for the IRFR app to go. Because the IRFR app goes out and makes a connection to the console from the inside out, the same way your computer goes and makes a connection to CNN uh, to get a web page or anything like that. So here's how we recommend you set this up. Okay. You have your network. It's still that great cloud. I love it. Um, all of those devices are the same ones you were looking at before. And then you have your wireless router. You take your wireless router and you take that WAN port and you plug it into your standard network. On this network, I'm going to assume the TI is configured as a DHCP server. So that means when that router boots up, it asks for and gets an IP address of 10.101.125.101. That's the IP address it has on the interface going to the network. What freaks people out is they then take their phone and they connect to that wireless access point, and it says, I got an IP address of 192.168.0.1. And they go online and they go to the Facebook programmers group right? <laughs> and they say, well, I'm trying to communicate. And somebody says, well, but your console's IP address is 10.101.92.101. That's not going to work. Here's the thing. Remember what routers do for a living. They connect networks together and send the data between them. In this configuration, that router knows this network over here is this. The wireless network is this. I can send the data back and forth, and it's just fine. The other great thing we like about this configuration, that wireless router over here, first of all, is not in the middle of your system. I don't know exactly how much you paid for all of that other gear over there, because I'm not in sales. Um, but I bet you it's enough that you don't want to risk its performance on the $39.95. I think that router has changed price every time I've mentioned it, by the way. But you don't want to risk it on that device, right? That thing you know is going to overheat and do all of those things that they all do. The other benefit to having it over there off to the side like that is yeah, I've, I've talked to the people who say, yeah, OK, now always on opening night or you know, final dress or something, I've got to rename the console. Because I know the students all have the IRFR app, and so that's the password to control the thing, and I don't want them doing that during the show. Right? What's the easiest way to handle it here? Unplug the router. <laughs> there is no wireless connection. Problem solved. <laughs> plug it back in for, for dimmer check. Unplug it again later. So that's uh, wireless stuff in a nutshell. Any questions about any of that before we move on? Excellent. It works, good. Uh, right, so we're now going to move on to designing your network system. Um, and you've all got handouts there that you can scribble on if you want. Um, it's easy to take notes. Uh, we're just going to talk through some things. Uh, we are going to sort of go back to talk about DMX. I know this is a networking class, but we do need to you know, talk about the differences between them and where we would use the two, um, because you can't go fully networked um, for various reasons. Uh, equipment types, some protocols, rules of the networking basics rules, um, system design, and then we, if, I, we're not likely to have time to have an open discussion about your system, so we'll have to skip over that. Um, but, but if you want to... You guys all can find us later. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then we've got a few bits of advanced stuff, again, if we've got time that we'll, we'll talk over very quickly. So advantage of networking is more than just DMX and RDM down one cable. Okay? We can get much more information down there. Uh, many more universes than one. Um, network cable is cheaper. It's good. Uh, unified systems and feedbacks, um, multiple departments on one cable. So there are many benefits over DMX. You know, backup systems, you don't need a backup system where you've got a DMX changeover anymore. You can do it all through the network. Uh, and expandability. Okay. But the advantage of DMX is uh, you can daisy chain it. Uh, you cannot daisy chain network. Uh, we had a question yesterday about fixtures that can daisy chain network. 
but what they've got is little two port switches in them. Okay? What happens if you turn the first one off? <laughs> it stops the chain. <laughs> what happens with DMX when you turn the first one off? It continues working. Okay? So there are those benefits. Much more further cable. We can go further than 100 meters. Um, and normally tougher cable. There are some shielded and tough Cat5, but that's quite expensive. Okay. So best, best of both worlds, network in the wall, your DMX doing your last mile to your fixtures. <coughs> okay. So running DMX along your LX bar rather than 12 bits of Cat5, one for every fixture going back to a switch. Okay. So we've got different parts of our system, um, the control, the power, and the gateways. Uh, and we've got various network bits and bobs there. Uh, so we have a Cobalt, TI, uh, our architecture ones, and the Color Source AV console. We haven't seen that does network as well. Power controls, our sensor racks, uh, sensor IQ, DRD racks. They're all network and they have advantages for feedback and things like that that we can do. And then all our gateways, which you saw in David's presentation, uh, all the differences of those. And then the switch in the middle. So plugging it all together and tying it all into one big network. Okay? So let's talk about protocols. Uh, I'm sure you've all heard NET3, SACN, ACN. Uh, and some of you may be confused about it. Uh, I know I still come across people that are confused <laughs> by the difference. Uh, Lowell, that's worrying that you're confused by it, but there we go. <laughs> we'll move on. So ACN is a standard. It's the architecture for control networks, E1.17. Uh, if you want a dull read, feel free to read it. Um, so this is uh, a standard that was brought out for configuration feedback uh, show control, various stuff that everyone can use all at the same time. Great. We can all talk the same language. Uh, problem is, not everyone uses it. Good for standards, eh? Uh, what came out of that, though, was the SACN part. And that is the DMX part, the streaming ACN. And this allows us up to 63,999 universes, theoretical universes, um, not one product I know of can do all of that together, but we do have a product that can do 1,500 of them. <laughs> There's a plug for Lull. Uh, so if you need lots of universes, we can do it. Um, but it's not got any of the monitoring or reporting that ACN has got built into it. Okay? So this is just the DMX bit, and this is what you find in most products that are doing DMX over the network. Okay? Um, and it is multicast. So it's lightweight. So again, that's why we have these IP addresses for the universes and you're sending to. Um, one thing to be aware of is that because it's multicast, it is not held by the bounds of your subnet. You're transmitting to an IP, an IP address. Anything on the network can go to that IP address and get that data, whether you can talk to it or not via configuration. And we'll come on to the problems with that later. One nice thing is part of the standard, it has a priority. So the standard says you have a universe priority. Highest priority wins any to, anywhere between 1 and 200. Um, we actually expanded that out to add per address priority. So you can actually split up who's in control of which bit of a single universe if you want to. And some of our products allow you to dynamically change that during operation to give you some very nice control of things like house lights. Okay. So how does that work? We've got a, two ions, both at priority 100. One's outputting channel uh, 51 in red. One's got it in blue. And we end up with the fixture in purple. <laughs> <laughs> Has anyone plugged two consoles together and uh, found they could only tilt and pan their moving light up? but never go down? <laughs> yeah, that's because you've got another console on that's at 50-50, so you cannot go below that. So to solve that, we use priorities. Our first console is at priority 100, our second one is at 110, 
and the second one wins. So our fixture is in blue. Okay. So uses, as I said, was house light switching. Yes, question. I mean, I would think in my head that that would not be best practice, that I, I would want to identify that those components are, because at, at that point, it's probably both of them are primary, is my guess. Yeah. You know, so. This may be where you've got a Turing desk coming in, okay. and you don't, you want to stay in control of certain things, and you don't patch their rig, so you don't have control of it. So I can leave my house light controller set at a higher priority, and then. Yeah. Then they can't override. It, it also gets used in even simpler shared control environments, like typically between the desk and the architectural system in the building. Yeah. Everyone happy with that? So SACN and ACN. So our SACN is only going one way from our console to our dimmer. The ACN is going both ways. So it's allowing for the configuration and the feedback from our dimmer into our console. So let's add the DMX to that. So SACN through our switch into our gateway and then DMX out to our fixture. So our console is sending out all of these addresses with priorities on them and the gateway is deciding which priority wins. <coughs> okay. So once it hits there and then it chooses what DMX to send out. So if it has two things at the same priority, it merges that data. Are you able to set those priorities from the console? Is that how it's accomplished? Yeah. So most of, in all of our consoles, there's a priority in the settings. Uh, you get one priority for the whole of the console. Um, but by default, I believe they're all outputting on a per channel basis. Mm -hmm. Some of our other products will allow you to drill down to individual fixtures or individual addresses. Any other questions? Is Paradigm one of those products? Yes, Paradigm will allow to do, uh, sorry, the question was, can Paradigm do SACM priorities? And yet, yeah, that will allow you down to a per address level. Mm -hmm. and, and we use that commonly in Paradigm installations to give and take control, not just of the house lights as a general concept, but of especially when you start having color mixers and things in that avenue. Because those are the times when you really have to be sure in, in, who's in control, right? For dimmers, Highest takes precedence usually makes everybody happy because you just turn the other thing down. But the problem is getting green from one source and blue from another source gives you a color that neither person wanted. And that's problematic. And the per address side of it allows us to actually have one source setting the color and the other source actually controlling the intensity. So if we throw RDM in there, um, does anyone know what RDM is, or doesn't, doesn't know what RDM is, or not heard of it? No, oh, that's good. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's normally one. Um, so RDM is the remote device management. So this is managing of your devices down the same DMX wire that your DMX goes down. Um, 32 devices per DMX line. Now. Some people, uh, we talked yesterday about splitters that do RDM. Um, while that is possible, we don't recommend it because everything slows down. If you've got 32 devices on 10 outputs of a splitter, that's a lot of devices and it's not a very fast protocol because it's got to fit in the gap of DMX. So everything gets very slow very quickly. And the other part is that is to remember there are different kinds of splitters. The one that you can pick up for $59.95 or whatever that number is at Guitar Center is probably a DMX splitter. It is not going to be an RDM splitter because DMX, simple, it's all going one way. It gets much more complex and much more expensive to put in the capability to listen to the messages coming back, especially when more than one person may talk at once, and then combine that and send it back up the chain further. So RDM comes back to our gateways and is then converted into ACN, which then comes back to our other products for us to do all the management and get the errors back. Okay. So throw that all together, SACN going one way, DMX going one way, and then you've got ACN and RDM going both ways. So 
how do we do this in the system? We have a control, SACN out, network, there's our cloud again, DMX to the fixture. Nice and simple. Let's actually do it with the console. SACN out to the gateway, DMX out to the fixture. Do you guys still have a bet running on that? Uh, well, no, we already we yeah. already solved that. <laughs> the joke is that that particular gateway is the wrong gender, um, and Lowell swore that he's been using that for years and no one ever noticed in any presentation ever. And we put it up for the first time, and Tom went, "Well, I see one problem." <laughs> Sorry, Lowell, I cost you money. <laughs> so, our larger system. Uh, we're going to plug in some more gateways into our switch, so we we'll, might need a bigger switch. Our console has got smaller. We'll point that out. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, you, in the previous example there, where I'm just going to go back, that's an eight port switch, so you can only have eight nodes on it. When you go above that, you're going to need a bigger switch or multiple switches. I would suggest just a bigger switch, if you can get away with it, is better rather than multiple switches. So there we've got our sensor rack plugged in, controlling our fixtures, all, vo all on the network. Okay. Any questions so far? Adding to that, we could add our conductor to our large system to allow for some management um, of various products and things going on, mm -hmm. and you'll find out more about that later on. Yes, this was the gratuitous plug portion of yeah. the class. <laughs> <laughs> and then the conductor could be connected to the real world. Okay, remembering the rules, star topology, 100 meters or 328 feet, um, no loops, no management, nice and simple. Okay. okay. Does everybody understand uh, the concern of a loop in a network? No. no. Okay. Because um, we mentioned it here and we realized yesterday it was like, oh, there was probably yep. an illustration we wanted. Um, <laughs> but, you want yes, yes, I do. Okay. Imagine you're working in a facility, you're, you're getting towards tech, everything is going along, and something's gotten unplugged, reworked, three or four things have moved, and at some point, someone helpfully comes along. They see a cable laying on the floor. <laughs> they see a jack next to it. They pick up the cable and they plug it into the jack, right? Because obviously that meant to be there, clearly. Yeah. But what they don't realize is that it didn't mean to be there because that cable runs 70 feet across the stage. It, well, it definitely runs less than 328 feet across the stage, right? Um, and plugs into another jack that is coming from the switch. So in effect, what they've done it's all obscured by building wiring, but in effect what they've done on a little teeny switch level is they've taken this port, they've taken a cable out of it, and they've plugged it into that port. The communication we're talking about, the multicast communication, broadcast, even the unicast packets, the way the switch is, is handling it is it determines this is coming in, somebody who is connected to this other port over here said they need it, one way or another, so I'm going to pass it on. So in this scenario, what's happened is, this packets go out over here. They come in over here. The switch says, somebody on this port said they needed that. So the switch sends it out. And it comes around, and it comes back in, <laughs> and we can continue to do that game forever. Or typically not forever, because sooner or later, the switch overheats and dies. <laughs> Right. Um, the, in, w in the scenario where the switch doesn't totally die, you may have witnessed this in some facility. Uh, you may have witnessed the situation where so as somebody was reconfiguring things and replugging stuff, they got to the point that they can turn dimmers up, but they can never turn them down. Okay. <laughs> That's one of the signs you're looking at this kind of situation. They've created a loop in the system. And here's the best practice for that. If you're finished with a network cable, <laughs> take it away. <laughs> okay. It stops people not knowing what they're doing, plugging that back in for you and trying to be helpful. Okay. Um, so we just said no loops. Oh, sorry, question. So creating a loop isn't an end all be all destroy it unless you uh, leave it there for a long time. 
the question is whether creating a, a loop will actually destroy it or not. The answer is it really depends on what you have as your network gear. In almost every case, undoing the loop is going to either solve the problem or get you to the point that rebooting a couple of devices will solve the problem. It's pretty rare that you're going to do permanent damage, and if so, you probably had a really cheap switch. Um. <laughs> Uh, so we've just said no loops, um, and now I'm going to con contradict myself and say actually in complex systems you can have loops, but there are certain provisos to that and certain bits of management that needs to be set up for that. Okay, so your cheap switch, don't buy three of them and just plug them together and go, yep, got myself a loop, it'll all be good. No. Um, so, but that management that needs to be set up needs to be set up correctly for our networks. Um, standard IT networks will probably cause you issues. Okay, so you might need, if you are working with your IT guy, you will need some information from us of exactly what needs to be set up, and we can provide that. So just give us a call, and we'll discuss it with you. Okay. So let's look at this in a theatre. Uh, if we've got a booth, a front of house position, an electrical room, and a stage. Put all our network jacks in on the wall. Um, we're gonna actually going to need three network jacks in the electrical room because we have three dimmers. Okay, so they need to be all plugged in. A switch to connect them all up to, and then our devices will plug into those network jacks. And again, this is where labeling your ports with the length is helpful because then you know how much more you can put on those ports. This network looks kind of familiar, except uh, I think the console is minimized even more, even though it's a bigger console. I think it's the same size <laughs> square, it's just a bigger image. Yep. Yeah. Cool. Uh, I'm going to skip over this one just uh, due yeah. to time constraints. So, uh, some advanced things to think about. Okay, so we talked about management, uh, what does that mean? So, managed versus unmanaged. No. Unmanaged means no configuration, usually more, less expensive and easier to troubleshoot. Okay? You haven't got to worry about settings, you just need to know is it doing its job or not. Adding management, you may need for your larger systems. Okay? So if you've got three venues or more or a campus wide or a theme park, you're going to need some management. Okay? Plugging in a chain of Cheap switches is not going to get you through. It'll work for a very short space of time. So there's a general rule of thumb. If you are looking at a switch and there's information in the documentation in the switch about adjusting the settings, about the configuration manager, about an IP address for the switch, these kinds of things, these are your tips. You're now looking at a managed switch, not an unmanaged switch. Uh, for, for small systems, unmanaged switches are great. When you get to the bigger systems, now you're looking at the, at the management options. And one thing I've seen in Europe, and I don't know if it's coming over here, is I found some small little five port, eight port managed switches that you can't do anything with. They are set up, ready to go out the box. You can't change the settings. So if you come across one of those, dis get rid of it, get something else, because it will cause you issues. Okay. Does it does it cost more than an unmanaged switch? Like in other words, you've got an unmanaged switch and then that switch. The generally, they're not that much more expensive because they're only five or eight ports, yeah. um, but they're designed for a small office that you just plug it in and it works in an office environment. But you plug it into a lighting network and it'll work for a small amount of time and then it'll stop. Um, so the compromise is buy your switches from us. <laughs> <laughs> um, we will provide pre-configured network switches that are set up, ready to go, and you can plug and play. Okay, because we've adjusted the settings. And th I mean, those settings aren't a secret. We're happy to talk to your IT department or whomever if you're you're getting a switch from somewhere else or you're working on their infrastructure. It's just that we don't know every switch out there and every setting on it. We know these. What's the lifespan? 
the question is, what's the lifespan of a 24 point rack mount switch? There's no good answer to that question. It depends on who made it. Um, like a Cisco at, Enterprise, Enterprise version. A Cisco Enterprise one, typically their service lifetime that they'll, at max that you're gonna see is eight years. A lot of them are five. Um, so it's, it, and if you're buying it at Best Buy, that number's probably shorter than that. Um, yeah, yes, if you take good care of them, on the other hand, I have certainly seen, I, I mean, I've seen Cisco Catalyst switches that have been running for 20 years that I reconfigured to do something else, and they did the next job really well. As a facilities person, is it, is it best practice to replace them every five, six, seven years? I would ask, especially in the case, you're, you're actually with an uh, educational institution, right? I would ask your IT department what their policy is and just follow the same rules they do. Okay. <laughs> um, it is probably something that you may update. On a, you're certainly going to update it on a more rapid basis than you're likely to update your dimmers. I'll tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> So just to bring up some of the settings that we deal with in switches and some things you may hear uh, and some things that may cause you some issues. Uh, so rapid spanning tree is the thing that stops loops being bad in managed switches. Okay, It decides which way the traffic is going and stops that loop connection until it's required. Okay. IGMP snooping is managing your multicast traffic, so your SACN. And this is where you may see your network work for about two minutes, two and a half minutes, and then it stops. Okay. Um, and what you need to help that is the IGMP querier to say, oh no, you really need to keep this traffic going to these devices. Okay. So that's where these cheap little five port switches are the issue. They seem to have IGMP snooping turned on, but not the querier. So you put them into the system, you test it, you go, brilliant, it works. A week later, you come back to it, and it doesn't work. Um, also, to point out, if you're talking to IT folks, or actually, this particular issue is more likely to come up if you were talking to someone who dealt with largely ETC networks that were installed five years ago or more. You may hear somebody say, spanning tree, oh, no, that's bad. Just turn that off. It's just a terrible idea. There are multiple kinds of spanning tree. Years ago, they developed a first generation of spanning tree, which was a fantastic idea. The problem was it didn't send any data out the port until it had confirmed there was no loop in the system. The interval of time involved was roughly long enough for you to plug it in and determine that port didn't work and unplug it again. <laughs> uh, rapid spanning tree works differently. It starts passing data essentially immediately. Uh, and then we'll shut off the port later if a loop is, is detected. So rapid spanning tree is what we recommend because it doesn't result in aggravated technicians assuming every port in the building doesn't work. <laughs> okay, so when should you be using managed or unmanaged? Will depend if your, um, one thing is your system is it connected to fiber optic. A lot of fiber optic switches now are managed. I don't know of any unmanaged fiber optic switches. Uh, there are a few that are just protocol converters, basically, yeah. yeah. Um, so you may need to look at that. Uh, do you want a redundant network? Do you want it to be, you know, if you cut through one cable, will the rest carry on? We'll come on to that. Uh, are you linking multi -sp multiple spaces together? So David said about the whole turning channel one on in one venue and it comes on in the other, because your multicast goes everywhere, even your different route. So do you need management to solve that? And also, how much data you're sending? Um, we, we have different rules of thumb over a number of universes, but we just picked a number. Uh, the one in London is 10. If it's 10 universes, we say you need a managed switch. Traces I, is 40. I use 40, but... <laughs> we went a bit safer. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and also what protocols are you using? How much are you sending? Are you doing a lot of unicast? Are you doing a lot of broadcast? Is it just multicast? Things like that. Because that will all put performance problems on your system. And also, what else is going to be sent across your network? Are you sharing your network gear with the sound department? Do you want to incorporate VLANs? So virtual LANs, so that the two networks never talk to each other, but you're using the same hardware. That may be something you want to do. Okay. Uh, also, is the, managed, is the network going to be managed by somebody else? So your IT guys, 
are they taking care of it? Or is it being, this is your network equipment? Are you using a hop into the building network just to get you that little bit further and then come back out? So redundant networks, uh, Tracy's just talked about the two difference between spanning tree and, and rapid spanning tree. But in this example, here we'd, we would need spanning tree enabled because otherwise we've got a nice big loop between our switches. It doesn't have to be a loop between one switch and itself. It can be multi, uh, multiple switches. Uh, so if you didn't have spanning tree on, this wouldn't work until one of the switches crashes. And then it would start working. The other one would reboot once it cooled down. And then it stopped working again. And you'd start the whole dance again. Okay? <laughs> so um, I had this. It took me a day to find the switch that was plugged into itself. They're all in cupboards. But, so, yeah. Part of the reason, this is, a, this is a layout that IT folks are very familiar with. You will see this commonly on campus layouts of buildings and things like that. The, each of those lines, those segments in between are a fiber piece and they just create a loop around the campus from building to building all the way around so that when they backhoe through, they can still reach the building while they fix the, the other copper piece or, or whatever they pulled and cut through. Yeah, if you lose any of those net uh, switch interlinks, you'll be fine. Um, if you're doubling up your network switches, so this came out of a project in the UK where we need more than one network switch in each location, we've got a link, an inner loop as such, and an outer loop. Uh, the corners are actually all in the same room, and then a link between the switches as well. And if you lose any one of those links, it will continue to work. Okay. In fact, you, there's probably scenarios where you can lose two or three, yeah, and it will you can lose at least two, and still everything yeah. is reachable. Now, once you get to this level, you are dealing in true network design. You're going to be consulting with us or consulting with your IT folks or whoever's, whoever's organizing that for the building, this kind of thing. Um, and you are dealing, you, you can't do this with an unmanaged switch. Okay. Um. Any questions? Is, is, is a configuration similar to this part of ETC's general scope when it comes to terminations and I mean, is that part of built in what to, to, to the termination side of things when you're turning on a building? Is this built into the cost of, of what that is? It depend if ETC is providing the network equipment yeah. or not. Yeah, so, well, the, the question actually was is this part of ETC's scope or not? Yeah. Really? And, and the answer is yeah, as, as Tom said, it depends on, who's providing, on who's providing what. I mean, the truth of the matter is, in almost no case, Actually, I can think of no case ever, which of course means there is one and I'm going to hear about it in about an hour. Um, would we be responsible for the links in between? Right. We might be responsible for the terminations at the very ends, mm -hmm. but that's pretty unlikely actually, because more than likely the, the linkages in this kind of a system are fiber. And generally speaking, we don't do fiber. Um, there are people who do fiber. They have tools that cost as much as everything on your desk. Um, <laughs> so typically, those get brought in by the electrical contractor or somebody like that in the US. I don't know, is it the same? Uh, yeah, in, in Europe, mostly, we don't touch the network equipment, so it's always provided by other people, right. which also means it's normally our problem when it doesn't work. But yeah, we'll <laughs> skip over that. <laughs> Towards the and I have a question from earlier in the presentation. Um, when you were talking about the ways that ETCNet handles the different kind of discrete protocols within it, with SACN and ACN and things like that, um, three of my information is a little out of date. But as of spring of this year, the Controls Protocol Working Group was working on an official standard for RDM over SACN. And I'm just wondering how ETC plans to handle that. Is that something you're going <laughs> to upgrade your software, or are you going to just continue to handle it the way you are now? Okay. Yeah. You want me to do it, or you want to do it? OK. Uh, we know that there is something it's uh, typically referred to as RDMNet. And like many things, it is a great idea. Uh, it is going through a standards process. Uh, the way standards get developed is you get a whole bunch of people who have an opinion in a room, um, and they work together, in theory, and they come up with how they think it should work. And then they send that out for review to the industry at large, and they wait for comments to come back. 
they address all of those comments and they keep doing this cycle after cycle until they until they don't get any comments that are substantive to adjust things. It's why it's called a consensus standard. It takes a very small amount. Yeah, it's it's something you can totally do in a week <laughs> or you know eight years, um, <laughs> depending, um, because we already wanted to address RDM and we wanted to be able to reconfigure things, we moved forward with our own implementation of RDM communication across the network inside ACN. So we are using the ACN structure to carry RDM messages back and forth right now. It is not what is proposed as a manufacturer agnostic RDM net approach for later. Uh, the truth of the matter is, and Lowell will correct me if I'm wrong, uh, the truth of the matter is we don't exactly know what that standard is going to look like yet. Um, we hope that we will be able to support that um, in even our existing gear, but we can't say until we know what it actually is. Is that an accurate? I'll just tack on another thing. We have a number of ATC employees on that standard committee. Uh, they actually are meeting today or tomorrow. Uh, one of our, our guys flew out this morning to go meet up with them. Um, so we are absolutely dedicated to, as soon as there is a standard, supporting that standard. But until we have a standard, there is not a whole lot we can do. Any other questions? Has anyone got any issues they've had with their system that we might be able to, we've got 10 minutes I believe, so throw them up. They're all very quiet. <laughs> mm -hmm. That's okay. Oh, okay. I've given him my RBI for every now and again, but every time we do it, uh, every day we had to uh, go pinging for a new IP address for that IP, or for the RBI. Okay. Like every time it booted up, it wouldn't connect with his ion until we went into shell and searched for open IPs again. Phone's problem, it, his lighting network goes through the building network too. Okay. Um, so you're saying that you you're saying that well, first of all, to restate the question, uh, uh, an RVI that's loaned to another facility and then comes back and no, you're no, the whole time it's down at his facility, every day when we turn it on, we have to go search it for a new IP. Uh, so the okay. So the part is that every day when when you boot it up, does it you're you're getting a message saying there's a duplicate IP? No, it just won't connect to the ion until you ping it. Yeah, we have to go ping for a new IP um, to change the RBI IP every day. One thing to check would be in the about window when you first boot it, whether it shows an IP address. Okay. If the console doesn't see. A network when it loads into the main software. Oh, that's true. Yeah. It will shut down. It won't get an IP. So it may be you're just dropping back to the shell yeah. and coming back yeah. in. It, I actually know exactly what that is. Uh, when your console restarts, it redetects the network port. So if yeah. you change your order of operation, start up the other one first. You should be fine. Okay. Uh, or just exit the shell and go back in. Yeah. It's Probably yeah. More than it. likely, it's actually the exit that's helping you, yeah. because the network then the network has initialized. So in this case, on the switches you're connecting to, it may be that they're just slow to initialize the port. But there's nothing in that console that would require you to change that to Yeah. That's well. quite the opposite. Sorry. So so if it's if it if the port then is initialized by the time you go in. So one of the ways to check that would be when you boot it, just tap the. Uh, are you going to EOS? Yeah. Okay. Just tap the EOS logo so it stops. Give it a minute. Go check in the settings and be sure there is an IP address before you go any further. And be sure it says that the network is active and then try and go in. And if it works, then that's probably what you're dealing with is that it's just taking a long time to initialize the, the network interface. What, 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 what would cause, how would you remedy the, the distance of time when they have time? Uh, how, would I, how would I remedy that? I would talk to whoever's providing the switch. Yeah and ask them to get us a switch that would come up faster because it seems like it's taking forever. And it may be that, that this may be a situation where you may be dealing with, and this is something we're starting to see in converged networks. Um, you may be dealing with a situation where they have a security protocol enabled on that port and they're having to go through multiple levels of the security protocol in order to fall back to the level of access that they grant when you don't have a campus computer uh, hooked up or something like that. Um, and then they may be able to, if that's a dedicated lighting port, instead set it so they bypass those security protocols and just hard code it to go to the lighting network. 
Does that make sense? Cool. Uh, any opinion on best practices when uh, the audio guys would like to share a little Dante network on your lightning network? Oh, Dante. <laughs> First best practice. You need managed switches um, at that point. Well, I, uh, so, so every venue has a ETC provided mm -hmm. enterprise switch that is currently configured as unmanaged. I, guess, so we, I can certainly manage the switch, but any best practices on how that should be set up? Uh, OK, the question, the question is uh, a Dante network wants to share and run across the same backbone on managed switches. Um, and how do we recommend you do that? Uh, the first recommendation would be, uh, remember we talked about what a LAN is, right? local area network. Okay. There's the concept of a VLAN, which is a virtual local area network. It essentially allows you to take, say, two switches that are on opposite ends of the building that have one link between them, and pretend that you have four switches that are on two separate networks, instead of two switches that are on one network. So you have a lighting network, you have an audio network. And you're typically going to VLAN between those. And in that case, the ideal would be there's no, there's no access to cross between them. You don't need a router to send anything back and forth. You don't want anything to go back and forth. Um, where you may run into challenges with Dante specifically is Dante's network timings are incredibly tight, um, tighter than a lot of video streaming. Um, and you may have challenges, you may have latency introduced that the little Dante thing will just tell you there's jitter and it's not happy. Um, the only way to find that out, I'm sure there's someone who can run the computations, but my answer would be the only way to find that out would be to try it. But you should be aware that uh, if you start, if, if for example you involve your IT folks and you start playing with this, one of the things they may ask about is another thing that can be in network packets called QoS or quality of service. Okay. In all of the lighting protocols, we do not set any quality of service. Our assumption and what you want for your lighting network to work is all of our packets should be transmitted immediately. Um, but we don't rank and give them a hierarchy of which ones are more important and less important in the way that, say, the folks who do voice over IP do. So what you need to be sure is that if they start streaming more and more Dante, they can't actually choke down your lighting network so that your data doesn't get through there. So you would need some configuration of bandwidth allocation to each side so that there's a guarantee for everybody that their data gets through. What do you recommend bandwidth size for uh, a standard lighting network with like six, I guess four or five? Yeah, and, and the question for that, the question is uh, maximum of what would we recommend for bandwidth? It's totally variable depending on the gear. We could talk later if you want. Okay. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> same time, we also want to upgrade our comm system, which is 20 years old, and then you know you buy clear comm, you buy ASL, anyone, they're all like, oh, you need a router and a whole package, and we update our console uh, uh, mixer, uh -huh. and it's the same game, like, so I just kind of like wonder, like, do I really seriously need to put in three separate networks in the same venue, <laughs> or how much can you really traffic in there, you know, it, it's kind of a... When I would talk to comm people, they're like, oh, you can only use 20 devices, and you're done. That's it. You can't do anything else. It's, it's, they have like a severe limitation. <laughs> this is a conversation that comes up a lot. Uh, USITT has actually just formed a committee to sort of discuss this and talk about best practices, which for some reason Tracy and I got invited to, which seems like a silly idea. Um, so we're, there is no hard and fast easy answer to that. Uh, there are a lot of things that we can sort of talk about that we, we could try. Um, but depending on what your switch is, depending on what your infrastructure is, how old your wiring is, there's so many variables. Um, what I will say is we have a fabulous phone support department, tech support department, and we also have an app application engineering department, which goes really deep into some of that stuff too, which are always available to help uh, for anything that you might need there. All right, well, I was just gonna jump up because you guys are wrapping up. Any other questions real fast before we talk? All right, well, thank you very much. Uh, that is our morning. Uh, lunch is being set up outside for you guys. Please do remember uh, class evaluation to either paper on your app. Uh, and if you are looking for an ETCP certification credit, forms are up here for this class. Uh, and we will see you back this afternoon. Thank you very much.